So we're back, Manish. We are indeed. Mate, so today we're talking about endo or endometriosis. And I'll give you my layperson's view of what that is. And uh, I remember 30 years ago, um, my best friend at the time, he's, um, well, he's still my best friend, but his girlfriend at the time had endo- endometriosis. And how it was described to me back then, I haven't heard any, anything different, was that um, it, that the womb or the uterus was covered in kind of like, where's my camera? Lots of fibrous uh, strings over the top and through the centre of the uterus, which um, seemed uh, like spiderweb sort of thing, and that was painful during sex, and that it was really uncommon back then, as far as I know. Yeah, look, it was. It was. Even when I first started doing obstetrics and gynecology 17, 18 years ago, it was quite. We used to see some very severe ones, but. There were, it's quite unusual to see any endometriosis, you know, and um, as I've spoken to you about this before, it's now probably the mainstay of my gynecology work is wow. is endometriosis. So it's really increased in incidence over the last couple of decades. But what endometriosis is, in a nutshell, from a definition point of view, mm-hmm. is just the presence of ectopic endometrium, which basically means that the lining of the womb is found outside the uterine lining. So it's found in, inside, outside the uterus. So, so the lining of the womb is found on the outside of the uterus. That's correct. So it can be found in any part of the body. So And it has oh, been wow. found in nearly every organ, including, I think, a recent, more recently, it was the spleen was the only place it hadn't been found, but I think that's been found now as well. Right. But what happens is um, you know, this tissue then grows and bleeds every month with the cycle, causing the pain and uh, associated with heavy, painful periods. And also can lead to painful intercourse, or what we call dyspareunia, mm-hmm. and uh, dyskesia, which is uh, painful pain when you open your bowels, mm-hmm. and dysuria when you pass urine. And the theory behind how endometriosis occurs was origi- the, the most commonly sort of quoted um, cause of endometriosis is um, Samson's theory of retrograde menstruation, where basically where he looked into the abdomens of these women when they were menstruating. And they found not only did blood go through the vagina and out to the outside world, but some came through the floping tubes and then seeded, he thought, seeded in the, the the lining of the abdominal cavity, which is called the peritoneum. So right. inside our abdomen, we're completely covered by peritoneum. And this is mm-hmm. a protective, very thin protective layer that looks after our body and uh, keeps all the organs apart. And yep. these, But they've got great blood supply. So if, if endometriosis seeds in those areas then the blood supply grows to those areas and it attracts blood supply to those areas of endometriosis and causes all those symptoms. Wow, so the inside of the, of the uterus, which regrows every month, those cells are found outside of the womb on the lining of the stomach? Or yeah, they can be found anyway. So the most and com- so every month it regrows? Yeah. Wow. M- most, most are found in gravity-dependent areas. So, right. And this is why Samson's theory makes good sense mm-hmm. is that it's found around the rectum and the vagina where the rectum and the vagina are very close anatomically and you can find there's a, a cul-de-sac there called gotcha. the, the pouch of douglas and that's a very common area but it's found around the ovaries and under the ovaries and that's the most common sort of areas and then you can find it in the diaphragm you know when you look wow. up at the top it's, it's it can be you can be absolutely riddled and all over the bowel so it can be anywhere on the bowel wow. so it, and there are various stages of that endometriosis, so stage one to four. And obviously the most common one we see is the lesser stage, which is stage one, where there may be one or two areas of endometriosis which can cause exquisite amount of pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas stage four, which is absolutely everywhere, may cause no pain at all. Wow. So you just go put a laparoscope in somebody who's got infertility mm-hmm. and to check their tubes and everything, and they're just absolutely riddled with endometriosis. And it, all, all the tubes and ovaries are all stuck together. And you get this thing where the ovaries actually, they're sep- very separate n- normally and anatomically, mm-hmm. but they actually come together and they, they get stuck together because it's, because it's bleeding, it get, becomes very sticky and everything sticks together. Right. So it's a major cause of infertility um, and there are two types of people who come and see me. One are very young women who come in and they've got very heavy, painful periods yeah. and pain with intercourse. And usually it's positional. So there are certain positions that are more tender than others. And uh, when you put a laparoscope in, about 95% of those women nowadays, in the old days it used to be 50%, but 95% now I have positive findings of endometriosis. Right. And what we do is we cut that away using laparoscopic surgery. Yep. Okay. So... The um, 
other other people who come and see me are the ladies who've been trying to get pregnant for some time, mm-hmm. don't really know they've got symptoms, they may have heavy painful periods, but I think women believe that to be normal. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes it is, and sometimes you don't find any cause for that, that heavy painful period, mm-hmm. but in a lot of the cases you do find endometriosis, yeah. and they're actually... Um, they they have subfertility and I operate sorry they have what subfertility so they're not infertile mm-hmm. they're just less likely to get pregnant gotcha. and the causes of why that endometriosis causes it infertility or subfertility are really nobody really knows mm-hmm. but um, I when I do surgery I, there's three things I do for laparoscopic for when I do endometriosis surgery mm-hmm. for infertility one is where we look inside the womb and I actually do a DNC where you actually curette the inside the uterus. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons that seems to be successful is because it regenerates. Because you've got stem cells in your yep, womb, yep. it regenerates it and freshens up the uterus, right. so to speak. The other thing is that we do is put dye through the through, from the vagina through the cervix, out through the tubes to make sure the tubes are working. And for some reason, that also flushes through. And w- there's no scientific basis behind mm-hmm, it. It's mm-hmm. just like flushing your plumbing, you know. Yep, yep, yep. And then the third thing is that we excise endometriosis. And to be honest with you, about 80% of women with endometriosis within the first four months will get pregnant. And that's my oldest data. Uh, post-surgery. Post-surgery. So it's a very quick way of treating. And if you go down the IVF route before you go for IVF, a lot of the IVF specialists who will say to you, oh, you need laparoscopy first because yep. we need to know what we're dealing with before we go in. And that's, that's right. why they're doing that. So it optimises the chance of you getting pregnant. And when you cut away endometriosis, what hap- what I believe happens is that the endometriosis itself releases a chemical which stops the sperm and egg meeting, or right. at least trans- mm-hmm. coming back down the tube into the uterine cavity mm-hmm. where it implants. So taking away as much visual endometriosis that you can see increases your chance of getting pregnant. Right. Going back to um, 30 years ago, there was no treatment for it back then. or No. Or, well, not that this lady could young woman could find at the time and and as far as i know she still hasn't had any children well treatment has changed a lot and um so uh, back in those days they used to call use a drug called danazol and mm-hmm. danazol um was anti-estrogen and but the problem with danazol when you took it long term is that it gave you permanent changes to your voice so it made you your voice a bit deeper and things like that so she had that so not many wow. pe- so not many people liked using it and we yeah. were desperately looking for a, a drug that was different to danazol danazol's yeah. a, you know wasn't tolerated at all well mm-hmm. but because these women were in such severe pain mm-hmm. there was nothing you know no tablets were available you know so right. so people were so desperate they'll take it and so um so danazol was the first line then when the only way of diagnosing endometriosis is by putting a laparoscope in Okay, there's no Mm -hmm. other way of Mm -hmm. doing it at the moment. Okay, so in really simple terms, what's a laparoscope? So a laparoscope is basically you make a small incision in the belly button. So it's about, uh, depending on which size you use, five millimetres to a centimetre. And you put the camera in, usually have another incision, usually in the pubic hairline, and then possibly one to the left or right side, or maybe all four, depending on how bad your endometriosis is. Gotcha. So in the old days, before we had great, you know, optical... Um, you know, cameras and mm-hmm. TV screens and all the rest of it. You you used to have to eyeball it. So you'd you'd put the laparoscope to your eye, mm-hmm. and you'd have one hand free. Right. So you were quite limited in what you could do. And this was only twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, so you would try and do as much as you could through a keyhole, or you'd have a big incision in your tummy, and that's how they'd sort a, of a visual observation. So yeah. so so it was really a diagnostic laparoscopy. But now we there's no there's hardly ever do we do a diagnostic laparoscopy. We when you do a laparoscope, you're always doing some. You, you try and treat it at the same time, right? And this is because we can see everything on the screen. You've got your hands free. You've got your assistant helping you, you know, and they're pointing the camera. And so, so, what you, so you've got a tiny camera on, on the end of this laparoscope, and it's a high definition Absolutely. light, so you can see awesome inside. It is. It's great. Great vision. You take photos before and after. You can, exp- wow. uh, you know, when you explain to a patient what they've got, photos are a thousand words, Absolutely. and wow. you can actually explain what what they've got, and so it makes a big difference. So, so but, after so after the surgery, you're there in either in front of a computer screen or printouts, and say, "This is what we went into, and now this is what we've got now." Yeah, absolutely, wow. absolutely. That's and the, awesome. And the beauty of that, if you have that on your computer system, is yep. that if they come back in four or five years' time, you can actually ah. see the difference in that. You know, so perfect down so, to the millimeter. Absolutely. So you can actually have a good wow. look at it, and you can see where it's all changed. So yeah. there's, but back in the day when Danazol was the main drug mm-hmm. of state, you couldn't 
do that kind of surgery. Yeah. So without doing an open procedure, which is, you know, women were in hospital for a week or so and, right. you know, it had high complication rate. Mm. And then, yeah. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, um, but l- later on, we then used things called GnRH analogs, which are like there. There's an injection that you take every month for six months, and it puts you through the medical menopause. Okay, mm-hmm. so the the drugs that we use, one was called Zolodex, and it's just an injection that you put into your abdomen and mm-hmm. basically puts you through the menopause for six months. So it switches off all your internal hormones. Right, and that had some success, but the problem is when you stopped it, it came back. So it was right. it was great in the short term to try and achieve fertility, mm-hmm. but then after that loses its efficacy yep, so absolutely so and then and now more commonly when as i said there are two main groups of women who come to me ones who want to have children ones who are, aren't ready to have children or already had children okay mm-hmm. so so it's fertility or not fertility mm-hmm. and those ones who have endometriosis who don't want children the other option is to put uh, a myrena intrauterine device in so uh, mm-hmm. now yeah. Okay, say that again. I so a Myrena. So, Myrena. So there's lots of things on the Myrena. Myrena is a little device. It's used for contraception, mm-hmm. okay, and you pop it into the uterus, mm-hmm. and it lasts for about five years. You can take it out beforehand. Mm-hmm. It's very easy to take out. It's a lot easier to take out than it is to put in, mm-hmm. but it secretes a hormone, uh, levonorgestrel, which is a progesterone, right, and it suppresses new endometriosis development. Right. And so, so you can keep that in for the five-year period until you want to have children. You take it out or you replace it. Wow. So that's the most common treatment. You can use the oral contraceptive pill as well. So you can use that continuously or some people take it for three months at a time and have four periods a year so they get less pain. And also it reduces the recurrence of endometriosis. So, wow. um, But there's also a variety of, you know, the, the reason we use progesterones is because in pregnancy, if you get pregnant, your endometriosis gets better. So wow. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg. You want to yeah. get pregnant and it'll, yep. it'll treat it. But the problem is when you've had that child, within three to four months, you get a resurgence of endometriosis in mm-hmm. some patients. So you end up going back and laparoscoping them between pregnancies to treat that endometriosis. Wow. So it almost behaves like a cancer, but it isn't a cancer because it, mm-hmm. doesn't, it only spreads locally mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. It doesn't, it's not going to kill you. Wow. But there's a slightly higher risk of ovarian cancer later on in life in those people with endometriosis. Wow. So is this a hereditary thing? Yep, there's definitely some genetics behind it and then passing through the families. But as as we talked about before with the epigenetics, I think it's more likely in the epigenetic hereditary. So, And this is why it's increasing. So these the diseases that are increasing, like breast cancer, prostate cancer, these are more likely because of environmental changes rather than passing it through the genes from one to another. It's Mm -hmm. the way that gene interacts with your body that's causing the problem. So so that... Although it's a bad thing, and we're going to see more of an endometriosis, it's a good thing because it allows targeted treatment using an epigenetic pathway. So as soon as we start to understand what the changes are in the epigenetics, then we can look at way at reversing that and reversing right. that process and using more medical treatment rather. And the mainstay at the moment is purely surgical. In fact, um, the, the I have just started. Uh, I'm doing some work with a guy in Lancaster University. Uh, who's actually now moved to Preston University, he'll kill me for saying that, mm-hmm. but he's at Preston now, and mm-hmm. uh, Professor Frank Martin, and uh, we've devised a possible screening test, you know, where you can do it in the rooms, you know, you just take a sample from the womb, and he uses a special technique called infrared microspectroscopy, mm-hmm. which can maybe screen people in the future, so you don't have to go for a laparoscope to have that wow. diagnosis. So that's hopefully coming in the next few years. And so what's... for? So this... Lots of different uh, grades of endometriosis. Uh, so it's a difficult question. So what's the not recovery? What's the success rate? I suppose for people who come in. Yeah. So for people with stage one to three. So the staging is done by where it is. So is it just on the vagina? Is it around the peritoneum only? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so is it on the ovaries? So if you get if you get an ovarian cyst associated with endometriosis, they're called chocolate cysts because when you open them, this chocolate like Max Brenner's. Wow. So it just comes out and it oozes out and it's just chocolate material. And wow. it's, so the chocolates just upgrade you to a different stage. Mm-hmm. And then depending if it's on the bowel and how deep it infiltrates. So there's two types of endometriosis, the red endometriosis mm-hmm. and there's black endometriosis. Okay. Mm-hmm. So red's very superficial. You can just burn it and, mm-hmm. you, you know, but, but the black stuff is 
Can, so when you burn it and get rid of it, is that a permanent solution? Uh, it's, it's, it's not permanent. It's not, and unfortunately, endometriosis is never permanent. Right. And it's, it's a temporary solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of people who do laparoscopes every year. I'm not a big fan of that yep. because I think when you burn so many things, new nerve growth occurs and mm -hmm. the nerve pain is probably worse than the endometriosis pain. Gotcha. So you're really trying to keep your laparoscopes to a minimum mm -hmm. and going to somebody who knows what they're doing with a laparoscope, mm -hmm. not just you know a generalist who says they can do uh, This is the big problem at the moment because the way that, Doctors are being trained now. We're very specialised. Uh, a lot of a lot of the newer doctors certainly are very specialised in what they do, um, and have a special interest in. I think the old days of the the sort of um, you know the the guy can do a bit of everything. Mm -hmm. That's starting to go. There are mm -hmm. a few of us left, but that's starting to go. So go to somebody who specialises in in endometriosis surgery, gotcha. and then get the optimum treatment at that time. And that's that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. And how's, how long does it last? Well, that's variable. It depends on the patient. It depends on the degree and the stage. Um, stage four endometriosis, you know, it's complicated surgery. You can do bowel damage, you know, and you and which can end up in the stoma. And the stoma is the, the bag that sits on the outside, yep. you know, temporary stoma because you damage the bowel. Yep. So it is high-risk surgery right. at that end stage. So if I have a patient who I'm diagnosing with endometriosis, if they're stage one to three, I'll usually tackle that at that time mm -hmm. but if there is high risk of bowel injury i just close up wake them up talk to them again and say look you're really at high risk here mm -hmm. do you want me to tackle it gotcha and then you know they'll say yeah i do or don't yep. or, and then we'll go from there and so i suppose there's really two different types of um patients one ones who want to get pregnant and ones who don't that's and right so the success rate i suppose for people who want to get pregnant um in the short term is pretty high. It is. It right. is. For those who want to get pregnant and there's no other issues, you know, there's no sperm issues and there's no ovulation problems, yep. you know, they're, they're the ones that will do very well. Yep. And uh, and those who are, um, you know, and the, uh, the ones that do you see who are a lot younger, because I've seen this as young as 12. Mm -hmm. you wow. Know? So they've had two periods. And I, they've come in with an ovarian cyst, which mm -hmm. I've had to sort out. And I've had a look, taken the cyst out and gone, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe there was endometriosis there because this is right. supposed to be your own hormones doing it. Right. If it was just our own hormones doing it, then right. it wouldn't happen till later on. Mm. You know, in the old days, it used to be people who had put off their pregnancies to 35, 36. Mm -hmm. But now I'm seeing it as young as in the teenagers. And it takes a long time for people to be diagnosed because they go to the GP, say, I've got period pains, I've got a bit of this. Oh, you'll be all right. Take, take the pill, or yep. do X, Y, and Z. You know, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. And the average time from first presentation to diagnosis is seven years. Wow. So the damage that can be done in that time. So if you can get on top of it beforehand by diagnosing, and I don't often laparoscope people under 16, 17 years of age because mm -hmm. I don't like doing it. Mm -hmm. But if they're missing school, you know, their lives are just a misery because of the pain, mm -hmm. then you've just got to bite the bullet and have a look. You know, and, uh, and unfortunately when I do have a look, they always have endometriosis. Wow. So, but at least when they've got a diagnosis, they know they can work with it. Yep. They know what it is. You can try and put something in place to stop to treat them. Yep. And to get them through the you know year 11, 12 at school, whatever, and get into university and and try and enjoy, you know, the natural progression to a sex life and things like that because that's so important to them. You know, I've got so many young people who can't have sex. You know, and they, really? it, it devastates them. I mean, it's wow. very hard on their partners and their relationships. So, it's it's not just the the physical man manifestations, but it's also the emotional manifestations that occur later on. You know, to these people who are trying to live with it every day and trying to get on with their careers, mm -hmm. missing work, the you know, the work colleagues might say, well, what's wrong with it? You've just got period pain, mm. you know. And if they've got a proper diagnosis, yeah. That's right. It makes it a lot easier. So, and, and as awareness is starting to increase and more and more people are becoming aware of endometriosis, mm -hmm. um, I think there's more acceptance that, yeah, okay, you've got an issue and we need to sort that out. And, and you're allowed a bit of time off work, you know. I, I so often have people, I say, when, when do you want to come in for the surgery? I, I can do you know, this week. Mm. Oh, well, look, I've got to go to work and do this. And it takes them three or four months to get in to see me because they're trying to sort out their work life. Wow. So I suppose that leads on to, apart from hormonal treatments and surgery, are there any new drugs on the horizon? Yeah. So when, uh, God, I think it's back in 2005, I started doing formal research into estrogens. That my, was my background. So I did an mm -hmm. MD thesis on that. And uh, I was very lucky because I, I was working in a lab that was looking at... Um, 
something unrelated to what I was doing, uh, something called gamma cyanucleum, which is just a, a protein or a peptide that hangs around the body and it's found in Alzheimer's and a few other things. Mm-hmm. And I had a bit of a hunch just to try it out and see what happens, you know. And, Sweet. Uh, and it came back a very strongly positive result. And it showed that when you have endometriosis, you need good blood supply. Mm-hmm. And what gamma cyanucleum was associated with was increasing that blood supply. So it's found in all the blood vessels around it. So... And it's taken about 10, 12 years. 2014, they've published a, a peptide inhibitor for it, and which which is a tablet that you take, yep. and that will hopefully reduce the severity of endometriosis. So, right. So these sort of peptide inhibitors are coming, but I think they're great in the short term. So if I can just recap a little yeah. bit. So endometriosis needs a strong blood supply yeah. to propagate. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what you've come up with is this peptide... I didn't come up with the peptide inhibitor, no, the, but I found the peptide that was associated. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so so the peptide inhibitor was done by a team in Canada. Yep. They've developed it because it's useful not only in endometriosis, but other conditions that are associated with gamma cyanucleum, which is this, this, this peptide. And they've used this inhibitor, and they found that when they put it in mice um, and put, the, put endometriosis, human endometriosis mm-hmm. into mice, using their peptide inhibitor to gamma cyanucleum reduced the severity of endometriosis. So through targeting the blood supply. That's absolutely right. Wow. So so and it's like any cancer. Cancer needs a blood supply. Mm-hmm. It draws and it, it sends out various chemicals that increase which attract blood supply to them. Yep. And that's that's the same with endometriosis. And that's what I mean, what I meant by saying endometriosis can affect um, you know, is is like a cancer but isn't a cancer. Gotcha, you right. know, because it just grows, you take it away, it comes back. It very much behaves like that. But Right. It isn't a cancer. It doesn't have a. Well, it does a very low malignant mm-hmm. progression, but it it doesn't actually get into your bloodstream and, and start infiltrating and causing problems elsewhere. Right, it's more localized, as you were saying. Yeah. yeah. And the, when I I used to do presentations back in the Gold Coast for the public, you know, uh, mm-hmm. when I first started, and um, I used to do this, I have an image of a woman running. Uh, for those who know Burley Beach, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I used to go down to Burley quite a lot because I quite liked it and then realised there were some other beautiful beaches around, so I'd mm-hmm. go elsewhere. But, you know, I, I remember driving to Burley Beach and I watched all these, I uh, just got to Australia and, you know, being from the UK, you don't really see many people running because it's bloody miserable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we, I was stood there and I was watching all these young women, you know, social class one, you know, really good jobs, yep. bottle of water in one hand, plastic bottle, iPhone with their earphones in yep. running. Mm-hmm. And filling their water up, drinking, carry mm-hmm. on moving, and they're the classical ones, the slim career women who think they're doing a lot of healthy stuff. They mm-hmm. were the ones getting endometriosis because it's not; it's a disease of, and it's nearly always slim women. It's not; it's it's very unusual wow. condition because most gynae conditions such as polycystic ovarian disease you know, endometrial cancer, these sort of things are all associated to being slightly overweight or being obese, mm-hmm. okay? So this is the one condition for those for, the, for slim women, you know, you right. don't see it in larger women very often. Wow. So whether your own, because in larger women you produce more estrogen mm-hmm. from the fat layer, mm-hmm. and whether that is itself protective is difficult to know. And pulsatory ovaries gives you that tendency to get, mm-hmm. put weight on. So um, the, so, the endometriosis is, is more found in those slimmer, more athletic types, and it nearly. And this is what makes my surgery so easy because when you're doing laparoscopy on very slim women, it's very easy to do, you know. And uh, right. and this is why that laparoscopic surgery for endometriosis has, it has exploded because people are finding it easier to do. Wow. So I, I think we've covered endometriosis mm. pretty well, mate. It is. It is. Look, I, I think the the main message from this is just don't suffer in silence and think it's your lot, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, you don't have to. And I think this is across the board for a lot of women's conditions. You know, we, I treat urinary incontinence and other things as well, you know, and people put up with so much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And eventually they get to the end of the tether and go, right, I'm coming in. And they wished, I, I get this all a lot. I do surgery on people and they come back and say, I wish I'd done this five years ago. And so your advice for particularly those, those younger women who are getting it, they go to their GP and what do they do? You can, when you go to your GP, you just basically say, these are my symptoms, you know, and I, I would like to have a referral to a gynecologist. You may or may not have it, mm-hmm. but have peace of mind. Mm-hmm. 
come and see somebody who knows more about it. Yep. There are lots of women's health GPs out there who are very good, you know, and they pick it up straight away. And they, awesome. you know, and but there are a lot because GP is such a wide spectrum, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And if you if you imagine seeing seventy men in a week, you know, and then one woman comes in with period pains, you know, you, you're not really going to be an expert in that. So, yep. Yep. so try and target a, a female. Uh, well, a, a GP a female, with a, a female GP or a GP with female interest, you know, gotcha. in women's yeah. health. So yeah. Yeah. that's who you want to go to first, you know. And there are many on the on the coast. There really are, you know. And and there will be in your area wherever you are in the world. There'll be people who are interested in that, and and then get referred to a specialist who has a particular interest. And there are a few, quite a few of us around, who are interested in, in endometriosis surgery. You know, I think if there's any people out there who have um, friends who have got concerns about endometriosis refer this podcast to them so they can get a good absolutely a good lot of information about it. okay mate i think we're out of time perfect thanks, thanks a lot. again mate no absolute pleasure cheers cheers mate bye bye